Section 6 of Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 5, by Julian Hawthorne, Editor. Section 6. Andrea Delphin by Paul Heise, Part 3. It was plain to be seen that some great excitement moved the minds of the crowds pouring towards St. Mark's Square from every direction. There was no singing, no laughing, nothing but sighs or whispered words, and a steady crowding toward the centre of the city. Andrea mingled with the stream, his hat drawn deep over his eyes, his hands crossed carelessly on his back. Now he entered St. Mark's Square, where the greatest crowd was gathered, in front of the stately ancient palace of the Doge. A company of soldiers were posted at the entrance, and no one allowed to enter who did not belong to the greater council. Upstairs in the wide hall, decorated by trophies of the great deeds of the Republic, the flower of Venetian nobility sat in secret conclave and the crowd below were waiting to hear the decision. Andrea worked his way through until he had almost reached the palace, throwing a glance as he passed into the interior of the cathedral, which was filled to the last corner. In a few moments more he stood between the two high columns on the edge of the Piazzetta Quay, watching the jam of black gondolas with their gleaming steel-shod prows that flashed back the rays of the sun. A large open gondola, rowed by two servants in rich livery, flew past the quay. Under the canopy a lady lay carelessly inclining on the soft cushions, her head resting in her hand. Diamonds flashed from her red-gold hair. Her eyes were resting on the face of a young man who sat opposite her, talking eagerly. She raised her head and looked out proudly at the crowd on the piazzetta. The blonde countess, Andrea heard the people behind him murmur. He turned with a shudder and found himself face to face with the youth Samuele. Where have you been all these days, sir? exclaimed the latter. I have been looking for you everywhere. If you will come with me, I have much to tell you that may interest you. He called up a gondola and drew Andrea in with him. "'What have you to say to me?' began Andrea. "'And where are you taking me?' "'Do not go to your notary to-morrow morning,' said the Jew. "'It may be possible that I shall fetch you for a more lucrative errand.' "'What do you mean?' "'You know what happened last night. It is unheard of that now. Twelve hours after such a murder here in Venice, there is no trace of the murderer.' We will have lost our credit with the signoria, with the people, and with all the strangers who expect our police here to work wonders. The Council of Ten are angry at such poor service. They will be looking for new helpers, and if you think still, as you did ten days ago, you may soon find better work than that which you are doing for your notary. I know faces, and I can see that you have yours in your control." The man who can hide his own thoughts is the man who discover the thoughts of others. I am still of the same mind, but who is to decide whether I can be of use? The tribunal will question you. All I can do is to recommend you. They are now choosing the third man again. I would not take the position, no matter what they might offer me. The inscription on that dagger was not made for amusement. But there is no doubt that the man who is chosen must accept the position, or will he refuse? Refuse? Do you not know that the Republic has a heavy punishment for any man who dare refuse office? They were now passing a broad stairway leading down to the water about which a crowd of gondolas swayed and pushed. It was the Palazzo Venier, where the dead man lay. Andrea forced himself to appear calm, and inquired, "'Have you business here, Samuele, or is it only curiosity to see the dead that brings you?' "'I am here on business,' answered the Jew, 
and it may prove useful to you to come with me do you know i would be willing to wager that among all these who come here apparently to condole there are not a few of our enemies the murderer himself perhaps may be even now dismounting from one of these gondolas he may be clever enough to know that he is safer here than anywhere else for the police are searching everywhere everywhere the slightest suspicion could fall with these words he sprang out of the gondola and held out his hand to andrea will it alarm you to see the dead he asked no indeed samuele answered andrea quickly let us go upstairs and pay our respects to the great man he was not likely to have received us so unceremoniously during his lifetime in the great hall of the palace the catafalque was set up under a high canopy tall cypresses reached to the ceiling the candles on high silver candelabra flared in the breeze that came from the open balcony and four servants in morning livery held watch at the corners of the bier the sharp profile of the dead man rose white from the black velvet of his shroud andrea recognized the features that he had seen and cherished in his memory from that short moment in leonora's room but no quivering of lips or eyes betrayed that the murderer stood beside his victim an hour later andrea returned to his home and heard from his landlady that the police had searched the room during his absence but that they had found everything in good order the little woman gave him much advice as to how to act in this dangerous time when suspicion might fall upon one for the slightest carelessness early next morning before he had arisen samuele entered his room if you are anxious to earn fourteen ducats a month said the jew come with me at once have they chosen the new inquisitor asked andrea i believe so and they have no clue to the conspiracy and none at all the nobility are much alarmed and are shutting themselves up in their houses the foreign ambassadors are sending one after the other their solemn assurances that they have had nothing to do with this deed the three will hold themselves more in secret than ever and there will be a price set upon the head of the murderer which will make a poor man rich for the rest of his life when they reached the palace samuel knocked at a little door in the courtyard and was allowed to enter up a narrow stairway after they had passed several armed sentries they were ushered into an apartment of medium size the windows of which were half covered by heavy curtains three men in masks which almost hid their faces were walking up and down engaged in a whispered conversation a fourth man unmasked sat at a table writing by the light of a single candle is this the stranger of whom you spoke asked the scribe yes your honor you may go now samuele the jew bowed and left the room there was a pause during which the secretary of the tribunal looked through several papers before him then he turned a sharp glance on the stranger and said your name is andrea delphin are you related to the venetian nobili of this name not that i know of my family have lived for many generations in brescia you live in the calle della cortesia in the house of giovanna danieli you desire to enter the service of the mighty council i wish to offer my services to the republic your papers from brescia appear to be in good order the notary with whom you worked there for five years gives you the name of a sensible and reliable man but we know nothing of the six or seven years before you came to him were you in brescia during that time no your honor answered andrea quietly when i had exhausted my small patrimony i was obliged to take a position as servant and i travelled with my master and your references they were stolen from me with the bag which contained my entire property i was tired of travelling and returned to brescia my various masters had utilized me for secretary work at times therefore i sought service with a notary and your honor can see that my work was satisfactory 
He said all this in a quiet, modest manner, his head bent slightly forward. Suddenly one of the three masked men approached the table, and Andrea felt piercing eyes resting upon him. "'What is your name?' asked the inquisitor, in a voice weakened by age. "'Andrea Delphin. Here are my papers.' remember that it is dangerous to deceive the high tribunal what if i should tell you that your name is candiano a short pause followed these words a silence so complete that the gentle ticking of the death worm in the walls could be heard four pairs of eyes were turned toward the stranger candiano he answered slowly in a firm voice why should my name be candiano i wish that it might be for as far as i know the candiano family are rich and noble and no one who bears this name need earn his bread with his pen you have the face of a candiano your manner and bearing show a higher rank than these papers would give you i cannot help the look on my face noble gentleman answered andrea calmly and as for my manners i have endeavoured to learn what i could from my various masters the other two inquisitors had come nearer also and one of them whose red beard shone out under his mask said in a low tone there is a resemblance i confess it is this probably that deceives you but you know yourself that that branch of the family which was settled in murano has died out entirely the father was buried in rome the sons did not long survive him that may be answered the first but look at him and say yourself if you would not think that it was old luigi candiano risen from his grave and grown younger i knew him well enough he took the papers from the table and looked through them carefully you may be right he said finally the age does not agree this man is too old for one of luigi's sons if he is born out of wedlock then we need have no fear of him he threw the papers down again and retired with the others to the window the steady glance of andrea's eyes did not reveal the terrible weight that was lifted from his soul at this moment the secretary began again to question him and discovered that he knew the french language and something of german after a few moments consultation with the three at the window the secretary returned to the table and said you will be given the pass of an austrian citizen born in trieste with this you are to go to the house of the austrian ambassador and ask for his protection saying that the republic threatens to exile you this visit is to give you the opportunity of making the acquaintance of the secretary of the embassy your task is to find out if any personal and secret relations exist between the viennese court and the nobility of venice you are to make no change in your manner of life we will pay you twelve ducats for the first month if you prove yourself worthy the sum will be doubled andrea bowed as a sign that the arrangement was satisfactory here is your german pass said the secretary your house stands next to the palace of the countess amide it should be easy for you to make the acquaintance of her serving maid we will pay you whatever expenses you may incur in doing this report to us whatever you may hear about the relations of the countess with venetian noblemen and one thing more here the secretary opened a little box which stood upon the table step nearer and look at the dagger in this box there are large armor factories in brescia do you remember ever having seen any work of this character Controlling himself by a tremendous effort, Andrea looked into the little box, looked at the weapon which he knew only too well. It was a double-edged knife with a steel handle in the form of a cross. On the blade, still stained with blood, were carved these words, Death to all inquisitors. After a long pause he pushed back the box with a hand which did not tremble. 
i do not remember to have seen this dagger or one like it in any shop in brescia he said the secretary closed the box and dismissed him with a gesture andrea walked out slowly past the sentries through the echoing corridor and not until he reached the stairs did he permit himself to sink down upon a seat his knees trembled cold drops shone on his forehead his tongue clove to his palate out on the open street again he threw back his head defiantly and regained his usual calm quiet demeanour with an apparently careless eye he read a placard announcing the high reward set upon the capture of the murderer then he called a gondola and rode to the palace of the austrian ambassador just as he was about to leave his boat a tall young man standing before the door turned suddenly and exclaimed in delight sir delphin how delightful that we should meet here do you not know me have you forgotten our evenings on the garda lake is it you baron rosenberg answered andrea taking the other's hand heartily are you in venice for some time heaven alone knows for how long said the other for you must know dear friend that i am now secretary to his excellency the austrian ambassador i fear you may not wish to be recognized as an old acquaintance of mine i am not afraid replied andrea if i am not disturbing you i would like a few moments talk with you oh then you were coming to see me without knowing me i am all the more glad to do whatever i can for you andrea blushed and felt for the first time the humiliation of his disguise the austrian pass in his pocket seemed to weigh like lead but the control that hard years had won for him did not desert him i wish merely to ask for some information about a german firm he said for i am here in venice in the very modest position of a scribe to a notary but as i was nothing more in brescia and you still did not think me unworthy of your acquaintance and that of your mother i am very glad to meet you again you must first of all tell me of that noble lady whose great kindness to me still lives fresh in my memory the young man led his guest up to a comfortable apartment where andrea's eyes fell first upon a large portrait hanging over the desk he recognized the brilliant eyes and the shining hair of countess leonora his host pulled two armchairs to a window through which one looked out over a broad canal to the rear wall of an old church sit down and make yourself quite at home he said can i offer you some wine or a sherbet but you are not listening to me you are looking at that picture do you know who it is but who in venice would not know it do not talk to me of this woman i know all they say of her and i believe it all and yet i assure you in all seriousness that even you yourself if you could stand before her would forget everything except joy that you are there is this picture your property asked andrea after a pause no it belonged to a more fortunate man than i a handsome young venetian who had the good luck to be her favorite the poor fellow was careless enough to become my friend and this crime has been punished by banishment and it is now my punishment to have this picture before me and to see the eyes of the original clouded with tears for his sake he stood before the picture as he spoke looking at it with sad eyes andrea looked at him in his turn with the deepest sympathy the young man could not be called particularly handsome but a mingling of youthful slenderness and manly gravity made him very attractive nobility and energy were shown in the grace of his tall figure his guest exclaimed involuntarily and you you too can love this woman so unworthy of you love answered the young german in a gloomy tone who says that i love her that i love her as i have loved at home say rather that it is an obsession that i wear her fetters with groaning and with gnashing of teeth that i am ashamed of my weakness and yet revel in it 
I have never known before what joy it is to feel one's shoulders borne down by self-chosen yoke, and to feel all one's pride crushed to the dust for a smile from such eyes. But I am tiring you. Let us talk of something else. How has the world gone with you since you left Brescia? Talk to me rather of your mother, said Andrea. What a woman she is! The very stranger even feels the desire to love and respect her as a mother. Ah, yes, yes, exclaimed the other. Let us talk of her. It may free me from this evil spell that has fallen upon me. Would you believe that I could be so ungrateful as ever to forget what a mother she has been to me? Would you believe that I have already received three letters from her in which she implores me to leave Venice and return to her in Vienna? She feels that there is some evil waiting for me here. Alas, she does not know how great the evil is that has already crossed my path. She does not know that nothing holds me here but a woman whose name I would not dare to mention in her pure presence. But no, it is not quite as bad as that. It would not be possible for me to leave my post just now. My chief, the Count, believes that I am indispensable to him, and there is much to do at this moment. It may not be unknown to you that we have fallen into disfavor here. They have even gone so far as to blame us for Venier's murder, a deed which we all abhor. For, don't you think yourself, he continued eagerly, don't you think yourself that it will be quite impossible to gain the evident object, the fall of the tribunal, through a path of crime like this? The question of morals quite apart, is it all possible that any conspiracy could remain sufficiently long undiscovered to make it at all of use. Quite impossible, answered Andrea carelessly. What three Venetians know, the Council of Ten knows. It is only strange that they were served so badly this time. And suppose that it should be possible to the conspirators to heap murder upon murder, until no one can be found who will take upon himself the dangerous honor of an inquisitor's office. What would be won by that? The pillars of a healthy state are undermined in Venice, and only the stern hand of tyranny can hold the rotten structure together for a short time longer. But you see how careless I am for a diplomat who would win his spurs in Venice. Here I know you only slightly, and I am already talking so freely to you. But I think I know something of character, and I do not believe that a mind like yours could ever bend to the service of the Signoria. Andrea held out his hand to his friend, but in the same moment he turned and saw several steps behind them his colleague Samuele, standing in the middle of the room. The Jew had opened the door softly and walked quietly across the heavy carpet. He bowed deeply to Rosenberg pretending not to notice Andrea. "'Your honour will pardon me for entering unannounced. There was no lackey in the anteroom. I bring the jewels you asked for.' He pulled several boxes from his pocket and laid them carefully on the table with all the manner of the Jewish merchant, a manner he was careful to suppress in his other affairs. While the young nobleman examined the jewels, Samuele threw a meaning look to Andrea, who had turned from him and was looking out of the window. He knew what the Jew's appearance in this hour meant. The spy was set to watch the spy. The old hand was to encourage the novice in his trial venture. When Rosenberg had chosen a chain with a ruby clasp, paid for it without bargaining, and dismissed the Jew with a gesture, he turned to Andrea again. "'Do you know anything about that Jew?' asked the latter. "'Oh, yes, I know him. He is a spy set to watch us in our house by the Council of Ten. I am sorry for your sake that he should have come in just then. He saw me take your hand. I wager that in less than an hour your name will be in the black book.' Andrea smiled bitterly. "'I am not afraid, my friend. I am a peaceful man, and my conscience is clear.' 
four days later on a saturday evening andrea asked his landlady for the key of the house she praised his decision to make an exception from his usual rule and spend one evening out of doors it would be worth while on this particular evening the funeral ceremonies for the noble lord venier in the cathedral san rocco would be well worth seeing andrea replied that he would rather avoid the crowd and that he preferred to take a gondola and row out toward the lido he left the house and walked down the street in the opposite direction from that leading to san rocco it was already eight o'clock a fine rain thickened the air but did not prevent crowds of people from streaming in all directions toward the great church across the canal where the funeral mass for the murdered inquisitor was to be sung andrea paused in a dark side street took a mask from his pocket and fastened it over his face then he walked quickly to the nearest canal and sprang into a gondola giving the order to san rocco the stately old church was bright as day with the light of innumerable candles and alive with the swaying movement of a tremendous crowd a great silver cross stood at the head of the catafalque and the coverings of black velvet bore the crest of the venier family the chairs arranged in a semicircle up through the entire depth of the choir were draped in black and were filled by representatives of the entire venetian nobility not one of them dared to be missing on this occasion for not one of them wished to allow a doubt of the sincerity of his grief on another row of seats sat the foreign ambassadors their number also was complete when the solemn sound of the trumpets from the height of the dome announced the beginning of the ceremonies two men walked hastily absorbed in eager conversation through a side street which led under gloomy arcades to the square of san rocco they did not notice that a third man was following them keeping closely to the dark shadows of the houses his face and figure hidden by a mask and cloak the two who walked on ahead did not wear the mask one of them was a grey-bearded gentleman of noble dignity of bearing his companion much younger listened with respectful attention to what the elder man was saying and now they came past the spot where a bright lamp in a house window threw a sharp light out over the street their follower in his mask had come close to them and looked at them eagerly as the light fell on their faces he could plainly see that the younger man was the secretary of the inquisition and the face and voice of the older man had been seen and heard in the chamber of the secret tribunal it was the voice which had told andrea delphin that he was a candiano go back at once the older man was saying and finish this affair immediately you may order the first hearing of the prisoners for it is not likely that i will be able to return until midnight if there is any immediate report to make you may find me at the house of my brother-in-law when the ceremony is over they parted and the elder man walked more quickly through the silent arcades toward the square the music in the church was silent now and thousands of eyes turned toward the pulpit where a white-haired feeble priest the papal nuncio was slowly mounting the steps supported by two younger clergymen there was not a sound to be heard as the old man's weak voice arose in a solemn prayer the last echo of the amen had scarce rolled down from the doomed roof when a murmur arose among the crowd at the portal running rapidly through the length of the church until the entire assemblage was swaying uneasily as the surface of an ocean all eyes were turned toward the great doors from which the nameless terror had come torches waved across the dark square and after a moment's breathless pause in the first birth of the excitement a hundred-voiced cry was heard murder murder 
a panic which threatened to tear apart the walls of the old church followed this sound nobles and plebeians priests and choir boys the guardians of the catafalque thousands of men and women all rushed blindly to the exit the old man in the pulpit stood alone in quiet dignity looking down upon the struggling crowd at his feet and left his place only when the empty church showed him that his duty was over outside on the open square the terrified crowd pushed and struggled toward one spot where gathered torches flared in wind and rain a troop of the guards called up in haste stood about a motionless body lying at the entrance to a dark side street by the light of the torches the blood was seen streaming from a wound in the side and in the wound itself was a dagger with a steel cross for a handle a dagger which bore the words death to all inquisitors end of section six read by lars rolander